next presenter today is gubernatorial candidate for Oklahoma, Dr. Mark Sherwood. He and his wife both, Michelle, are uh, naturopathic doctors. He's a championship bodybuilder, a number one selling author, New York Times bestseller, uh, successful film producers, strong faith-based spiritual leaders, and I might add uh, a gentleman. A, a godly fella, and uh, I'm uh, growing to appreciate Mark more the more I spend time with him, and so it's an honor for us to have him this morning. Put your hands together for Dr. Mark Sherwood. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Honored to be here, thrilled to be here. Uh, Brother Jesse, I want to thank you for the absolute um, incredible honor it is to stand in front of you all today. I really am appreciative. John, great job. That was amazing. I echo those sentiments. Don't leave, don't let him take one book home. Deal? All right, seriously, that is incredibly important today. I want to stand before you, and as every time I do speak, I want to publicly acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's most important, most important. I want to also acknowledge my wife, who's my best friend, my queen, my workmate, my partner in life, and we get to be together every day in the same office, and I love it all the time. So uh, she can't be here today, unfortunately, and I miss her deeply, so you'll have to pray for me in my mourning process, please. <laughs> um, with that said... Um, I wanted to share a little bit about my background. I think that's important. A lot of people don't know a lot about the background of the person who stands in front of you. And I want you to know I gave my life to Christ when I was eight years old. And that was the beginning of the rest of my life as I know it. Uh, growing up, I had a dream and goal to play professional baseball. And I actually got to do that in the country of Australia. I served my city here in Tulsa for 24 years as a police officer. Yeah, thank you. We need to appreciate our men and women who serve. If you see them out, buy their meal, buy their coffee, buy their drinks, and tell them thank you. They've been victimized and brutalized far too much. During my time in the police department, I was able to serve on the SWAT team for 10 years, and that has been a wonderful experience, both good and bad, to see people at their best and worst. And so... Um, also, I was able to travel the world with the power team. How many remember those guys with uh, breaking the bricks and all that kind of stuff? So I've spoken on every continent, praise the Lord, uh, except for Antarctica. And I said I would go if I had a burning bush experience to go there. I probably would do that. <laughs> um, been through some hard times, too. Uh, anybody that stands in front of you that says they haven't been through hard times is not telling you the truth. I have been through some challenging times from divorce, false accusations, and the suicide of my mother. I stand before you as a person who has been able to overcome those things, not because it was fun, not because it gave me great joy, but because it's part of life. It rains on the just and the unjust alike, and I've learned that over time. You know, when we look at this whole idea of why I would run for governor of Oklahoma. I ran into a great friend, Norm, talking just before we began. He said, what prompted you to do a crazy thing like that? Fair question. It all goes down to being obedient, obedient to the call. When God calls you to do something, you step up and do it. You don't back down one bit. I wrestled with that decision for probably two months before I finally yielded to the call. And God has called me into this place and time this season to be a person of influence, not for myself, but for God. We need to bring God back into our lives first and government next. When we bring Him back into our lives, we bring Him back into government. Government, and I agree with everything that's said so far, is the main attack point right now to try to gain power and control over a citizenry without respect of their wishes. I'm going to lead today with a story of Daniel, just to paint the picture of what I'm talking about. A little bit about Daniel's story. As we know, he was living his life in Judah, and he was captured as Judah was overtaken by King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Daniel was kidnapped, brought to Babylon. Now, please understand that we as believers are from a different kingdom, deposited here on this earth to make a difference where we're planted. So all of us have the call of Daniel on our life. We're called to make a difference. We're called to do this kind of stuff. When we look at Daniel 1.8, one of my favorite parts of the book of Daniel, I want you to catch this. Word And it was used once before here in the pledge just a moment ago. But Daniel resolved. Everybody say resolved. He resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, when we understand this word resolve, we know that Daniel had made up his mind before the problem began. It wasn't something that he just came up with on the fly at the spur of the moment. He made up his mind and heart and spirit before he began. We need to be resolved, ladies and gentlemen, not to back away from the call of Christ on our lives. No matter what comes our way, it doesn't matter who comes our way, it doesn't matter when they come our way or how they come our way, we need to be resolved. Folks, I am resolved in my life, based upon everything I've been through, I'm not going to be corrupted by this world. I don't care what happens to me. I care about standing in the gap for people. We need to step up, stand up, and speak up, and not back down. It is time that we must not bend one knee to a tyrannical government. Period. We must not back down. We must not step down, and we must not allow anyone to take any more ground. So three words I want you to take away so far is stand your ground. Stand your ground. And we see what happened to Daniel in verses 9 through 20 of chapter 1. He made a deal. He was given favor with the guard. And he says, I don't want to eat those foods. I don't want to be part of that culture. Folks, as a believer, we're not part of this culture. We are meant to influence the culture, not to become culturized by the culture. We too are to affect the world, not be infected by the world. It is very important to understand that Daniel, when he took up his mantle of resolve, he was given favor. Once he was given favor, he was given opportunity. Once he was given opportunity, he showed himself worthy by the call of God in his life, and the king, guess what, elevated him and his three friends, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to positions of authority and influence. And we know what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know the fiery furnace. But I remind you, there was a fourth man, the fire, and that fourth person allowed them to walk out of that fiery furnace that killed the guards that threw them in with not one stitch of their clothing singed by that fire. And we know what happened to Daniel. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. The, the rock was rolled over that place. And Daniel walked out of that lion's den because the Lord God Almighty not only protected the three guys, but he shut the mouth of the lion. Now, folks, who are we to believe that anybody that comes at us from this world is, over to, is able to overtake us? No one can overtake us if we have the power of God in us. We need to stand firm just like Daniel. And they influence the kingdom they didn't change the kingdom, but they influenced the kingdom because they stood up for righteous principles. They allowed God to empower them. Folks, today we live in a time of deep tyranny. When the government is forcing its will over us as a people. I remind you this statement, when tyranny becomes the law, defiance becomes our duty. We must not back down one bit. We must stand our ground. We need to be empowered by having God front and center of our lives. God will protect us. I know that without question one bit. Now understand today, we don't have a virus problem. We have a lack in trust of trust in God problem. And that's a fact. We've seen that over the course of time. 9,000 people in our clinic that we've dealt with around the world, really? Nobody died of COVID, praise God. Because we put faith in and took fear out. Fear is the most contagious pandemic we have today. That is not a viral problem. That is a God problem. Remember that fear is the native language of our enemy. Folks, there is no need for vaccine mandates to people to lose their job. 
I'm not anti-vaccine, but I'm anti-mandating people to put anything in their body against their will and free choice. <laughs> Period. I've asked people this question. Did Jesus take a vaccine? They're like, of course not. Did Jesus wear a mask? Of course not. Then I remind people, don't you understand that you have the same power in you that Jesus had in him? Do we really believe that? If we believe that, we will stand our ground and not back down one bit. Folks, we need to understand that we are not born with medication deficiencies. God is not an idiot. Do you think that you're born with an ivermectin deficiency? I mean, seriously, that doesn't even make sense, does it? And again, not knocking ivermectin, but to think that you have to have that around just in case is allowing a fear, a seed of sickness into your house and life. Remember what Job said, what I feared the most has come upon me. Stop the fear, bring in faith. Folks, we need to understand that in Galatians 5.20 and also in Revelations twice, we use the word pharmakia. That word pharmakia is from the root word sorcery, witchcraft, which is seen in the Greek. And it's unfortunate that that has become our first line therapy. Last I checked, God put medicine in food. There's food in the leaves that heals the nations. I read that somewhere in a pretty good book called the Bible. You see, folks, we don't have a virus problem. We've got a God problem. We need to understand that these mandates need to go. We need to stand up just like Daniel did, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, and not back down one bit. Folks, we have open borders. Do we realize that? We have open borders. People that are coming in from Texas... Arizona that have sinister intentions on their mind. If you think you live in Oklahoma and you've got secure borders, think again. If Texas is open, so is Oklahoma. We need to secure these borders. Oklahoma borders are open too. We need to protect our borders. And it's not up to the federal government to do it. It's up to us as citizens to do it. Folks, right now, we need to understand the security of our borders is our responsibility, costing our lives if need be. We need to begin to step up against the tyranny by securing our borders. This is not a border problem with our borders of our states. This is a God problem with the borders of our lives. We need to kind of get that idea. Folks, we need to stop abortion. Quit playing games with pro-choice. I see it all the time. I'm pro-choice. The pro-choice people are happy because they still get the money. The pro-life people are still happy because they still get their money. And babies are still being murdered to the tune of 30 every day in Oklahoma. Four clinics right now. Two more opening. Tell me we're pro-life. We need to stop it immediately. I remind you of my time in law enforcement. The lady gets pregnant. And she's pregnant three weeks. Somebody kills her, unfortunately. That is double homicide. But if that lady decides to abort that baby because it's more convenient, that's not homicide, that's choice. How irrational is that? We need to understand there's a way to look at things in a rational, logical, and godly way as opposed to a worldly way. When our society permits and even defends sin, this is not a choice problem, it's a God problem. I made a promise to people a while back, and I have a plan to do this. I will absolutely abolish abortion within my first 30 days in office. I promise you that. I promise you that. And it's going to cost us something. My wife has sat down and I, we've counted the cost. It may cost us our lives, but it's worth it. So I'm going to stand the gap in an interpositional position and defend those who can't defend themselves. Folks, we don't need pronoun choices. We do not need that. That's about as ungodly as I've ever seen. God made men and women, not 47 gender choices. That is not of God. Pronoun identification is not a, 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 a woman or a man problem. It's a God problem. Folks, we don't need CRT. We need to understand 
teaching our kids respect and honor and dignity. Biblical principles, once again, is where we need to go. That's what we need to teach our kids. Honor, honoring your parents, honoring your teacher, honoring authority, once again, learning how to say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and keep opening the door for the ladies out there, man. Chivalry is not dead unless you kill it. We need to understand that there's only one race, and that's the human race. In the kingdom of heaven, there's no black, there's no white, there's no male, no female, no Chinese, no Japanese, no Heinz 57. We are all one people because God made us all in his own image. Folks, we understand that this CRT is not an education problem. It's a God problem. Folks, we need to regain state sovereignty once again. We need to start standing against the government and stop depending again on them to care for our needs, our food, and our defenses, and our funds. Too many times we've got federal monies coming in here just like a bunch of strings. We'll give you the money if you'll do this. How well is that treating us right now? You see organizations around our state following federal guidelines, and I get the emails every day from people that are fearful of losing their jobs. Why are they fearful of losing their jobs? We're just doing our job. I saw a great meme. Jesus was laying on the cross, getting the nails drove in his wrists and his feet. And people were standing around, and I saw these cartoon-like quotes that said things like, I'm just doing my job. I have to feed my family. I can't lose my income. I'm just following orders. I don't want to do this, but I have to do this. Folks, are we in that place right now? Are we crucifying Christ all over again? I submit to you, just like John Harris just said, this government today is becoming a demagogue, trying to play, take the place of God in our lives. We need to understand that God needs to be the center of our lives once again. Depending on the government to take care of us would be like Daniel depending on Babylon to take care of him doesn't make any sense we admire Daniel but how many in here says I'm a Daniel too you see we need to understand stepping up standing up is not a government problem it's a God problem folks we can get this and understand this guns don't kill people people kill people don't give up your guns I've been around this game of violence for the last 35 years. I've seen people die in front of me. I've watched them take their last breath. Violence is real. People kill people. Guns don't kill people. Cain did not kill Abel with a gun. He did not need a gun to commit violence. Violence is in all of us. We all have the potential to do everything evil and everything good. That's why we need God. Folks, taking guns away is not going to prevent violence. That is farcical and idiocy. It doesn't work like that. It never has. It never will. Look at the cities that have done that. Look at the states that have done that. How's it working for you, as Dr. Phil asked the rhetorical question? Folks, a well-armed citizenry is the greatest deterrent to crime. Violence with guns it's not a people problem. It's a God problem. Folks, we need righteousness to return. And frankly, we need a little bit of righteous anger to return as well. <laughs> righteous anger that's intent on restoring right again. In Matthew 21, verse 12 through 14, remember the story? Jesus in his last week of life walks in the temple and he sees something going on in the lobby. The foyer, if you will. They're buying and selling there. He looks around. He's upset. Is it okay to get upset about something that's unrighteous? Yes. Jesus got a little bit ticked off. He decided to put a whip together and went in there like a madman and turned over the table. He said, get out of here. Who are you to turn my father's house into a den of thieves? My father's house is a house of prayer. And get this. After, not before. Everybody say after. After he drove them out, 
People were healed in the temple, not before, but after. We need to drive the stuff out of our temple that's causing us to have a lack of healing by God's presence. Folks, a lack of healing in our physical bodies, in our emotionals, in our spiritual selves is not a medical problem, a government problem, or a church problem. It's a God problem. We need to understand that pastors aren't going to save us. The president is not going to save us. The surgeon general is not going to save us. But God is a saving God. Folks, we need warriors and fighters to stand up. To stand up and run for government positions. I'm called to bring God back to the Capitol as your next governor. And I make no bones about that. You'll see me praying with the window open. Just like Daniel did. I don't care what people think. I will not be ashamed. We're going to broadcast repentance. We're going to broadcast hope. We're going to broadcast healing. We're going to broadcast faith. The church must arise and get involved as well. It's not a time for political babble. It's not a time for biblical babble. I don't want to see one more sermon. I'll, I'm here one more sermon. I want to see another sermon. I want to see those sermons. Don't give me those political, biblical babble things anymore. Folks, there's no fear in true leadership. True leadership doesn't exhibit cowardice. Politics exhibit cowardice. Leadership is something totally different. I'm stepping up, won't you? Won't you do your part in your family, your community, your school boards, across your state? Won't you do your part? I'm going to challenge you to step up and do your part. Don't back down. And I'm going to challenge you to keep us in your prayers. Seriously. There's some cards right back there that my assistant Jacob will get you. Whether you vote for me or not, I want you to take those cards because it's going to be a reminder to pray and get involved. So I want you to take those cards. I want you to step up, stand up, speak up, stand your ground. Remember that to bring God back in our government, we got to put him back in our lives. Folks, I love you. I'm grateful to be here. And I bless God for the opportunity. God bless you all.